Okay, so this is the video for lab eight, the molar, determining the molar mass of a volatile liquid. So we're gonna cover a few things here. Really, we're just gonna make sure that you are up to date with what we're really trying to do. This is a slightly shorter lab than some of the others, and it's important that you really understand what you're trying to get out of this before you really move into it. We're gonna go through the ideal gas law and how we're using it in this lab and we'll cover some of, the more uh, some of the more important details of the procedure. We'll look at how to calculate both moles and then molar mass of your unknown, and really um, evaluating both your lab techniques, laboratory sources of error, and more importantly, what effect they're gonna have on your results here. So here we're gonna talk about how to find the molar mass of an unknown compound using the ideal gas law. Now, for our purposes here, we're actually focusing on a vapor, which is the first time you guys have really focused on that, um, besides measuring the volume that was collected in an earlier experiment. And it's just kind of an interesting way to look at things here. We're going to look at what molar mass you end up calculating and compare that to things in a table so that you can really understand uh, what your unknown should be according to your results and if uh, you are told what it is, how did you get something that was different? Unless it was really right on. So, so determine how sources of error are going to affect your measurement. This is probably the biggest part here. Um, you know, guys, nothing ever really works in lab the first time or every time, and that's okay. It's more important that you understand why something didn't work than necessarily getting within 15% of the correct answer. So for our purposes, just to kind of remind you of what the ideal gas law looks like. Now you guys saw this back in, um, I think it was lab three, but we really didn't delve into it because you weren't quite there in lecture yet. So here, now we're there in both lab and lecture. Um, so the ideal gas, gas law is PV equals NRT, where P is the pressure in atmospheres, V is the volume in liters, N is our moles, R is the gas constant. Um, for our purposes, this has the value, um, oops, 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. Now, sometimes you can round this to one, um, so it's 0 0.0821, but really, whenever you can, try to keep it as the, the four sig figs. It's just going to give you a little bit more uh, pr precise measurement, and it gives you more insight to what's going on um, when you get your, your number in terms of rounding. And finally, you get the temperature in Kelvin. Now, the two big things here, guys, are making sure your units are in the right format, okay? So a lot of the time, students forget to change milliliters, which is what we measure our volume in. Uh, with our graduated cylinders and so forth over to liters or they forget to change the temperature which is usually measured in lab in celsius over to kelvin and either one of those is going to have disastrous effects on your your end result now we spend a lot of time in lab focused on solids and liquids and that's because the particles are closely packed the they are easy to see visually they tend to stay put. They're not going to just float away. For this lab, we're actually looking at a gas. And you can kind of see, you know, just like you already know, the particles are really far apart. What that means is because they're bouncing around everywhere, they can escape. So we actually are going to take advantage of the fact that we have a volatile liquid. Volatile um, is just another way of saying easily evaporates. So if you've ever had like rubbing alcohol or a fingernail polish remover or something along those nature spill, um, and you, you can almost watch it evaporate instantaneously. It'll even if you use rubbing alcohol like on your skin, it'll feel cool. And that's because it is sucking the heat out of your hand to evaporate. And so we are going to start with a liquid, which is really good because it stays put in the flask we put it in. We're going to heat it up to convert it to a gas. 
And then when we want to measure the amount of gas that we have left, we convert it back to a liquid so we know it's not continually floating away. And so that's going to kind of allow us to measure a vapor in a way that you might not have ever considered before. So here's our setup. Okay, so we're going to start with a water bath. Now, in general, guys, um, this is slightly off from what it's really going to look like. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to come in and set up a water bath and a 600 ml beaker. You just want to fill it about two thirds of the way. Um, you want to have it so that it's mostly fill, but if you add the flask in, it's not going to overflow. So you're going to start heating that pretty, pretty much as soon as you start, because that takes the longest out of anything in today's lab. So if you don't start heating, you're just going to be there much longer than you really need to be. Now you're going to then have this little um, apparatus. Let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger. A little distorted, but that'll work. Um, where you have a ring stand clamp holding the thermometer. So you're going to go ahead and set this up. You want the thermometer not to be all the way at the bottom, not to be at the top of the liquid, but really to be right in the middle. This is, you know, my mistake. It really should be about right here. And you want to measure the temperature in the middle of this water bath. And the reason for that is just like anything else, if you're all the way down here, it's going to be really hot all the way up here. It might be a little cooler. So this is the best bet in terms of, um, getting your temperature. Okay. So you want it to be right in the middle. Now, um, the procedure tells you to add some boiling stones. That's really just to keep the, from having like big bubbles and kind of bumping around and stuff on the hot plate. So you have your hot, your, your water bath heating up and you're going to have your, once that's heating, you go and get your flask ready. Now your flask, you know, just like all other Erlenmeyer flasks guys, is going to be just a, okay, so you have this flask and, you know, we're going to be adding just about four mils, a little bit more, a little bit less, probably less is better to this flask. And we're going to end up converting it to a vapor. Now we know from the picture on a few slides ago that the particles of a vapor are so far apart that that four mils is more than sufficient. And so the whole purpose of this is you're going to add a little bit of liquid, you're going to heat it up, get it to fill up this entire flask, and all of the excess is going to flow out until you're left with something at the same pressure as the atmosphere, and then you'll convert it back to vapor. Now, the best thing to do would be to have a container that is truly... Uh, well, better contained. We'll go with that. But here, what we're going to do is take advantage of the fact that we can cover this with foil and use a rubber band to hold that on. And this is essentially a closed container. Now you guys are going to poke a couple holes in it to keep it from being truly closed and therefore, you know, potential explosion from happening. But you're going to have a container that is going to allow that vapor to fill it up and it's going to continue to fill um, with vapor all of the excess all of the particles that are closer together th than they should be you want them to be just just like what's in the uh, laboratory all of those excess particles are going to flow out of the holes in the foil okay so it's it ends up working out pretty well so while your water bath is heating up, you're going to go measure the empty mass of your flask, the foil, and the rubber band, and then you're going to add four mils. Now, once you do that, and I couldn't really figure out how to draw two ring stand clamps over here, but you're going to insert, you're going to have your four mils in here, you're going to cover it with the foil, the rubber band, poke two to three holes in it, and put it in the water like this. This is also going to be ring stand clamped. You want to go as far down into the water as you can, but preferably not have the foil get wet because that could affect your measurement later. And you're going to do that for, I think the procedure says between two and five minutes. What you're really going to look for is for the little bit of liquid down here to disappear by your site. And then you're going to wait about 30 seconds longer. Now it's going to be kind of hard to see that. 
these flasks have a little um, convex shape to the bottom. So sometimes an air bubble can get trapped under there. So you want to make sure that you're not looking at an air bubble, you're not looking at the glass, you're looking for where that clear colorless liquid has disappeared and has been replaced with a vapor. And you're going to wait only a little bit longer. If you wait too long, all of the gas particles go out. If you do it, uh, if you stop too soon, you're going to have too much uh, vapor inside. So when you condense it, you'll have too much liquid. But anyway, so what you'll do is you'll ring stand clamp it to it and you'll lower it into the, the water bath. When you're ready to remove it, just lift it, flip it over here, let it cool in the air until it's cool enough to touch. And so that's pretty much it. Once the flask is cool to the touch, you're done with that trial. You can go ahead and get your measurement. Okay. So here's how it's going to end up working. You have this setup right here and you have your data sheet. Now this is taken straight out of your lab. It's just a uh, format. It's slightly different. So here we've got um, for the mass of your empty flask, your foil, you're going to get the mass before and after. Now, when you go ahead and cool it back down after heating, it's not going to look like there's four mils in there because the four mils you added was such an excess of what you needed. It's going to look like there's maybe one or two drops left. It's not going to look like much. And so this number is going to be, um, just barely larger. And so to get the mass of the volatile liquid, all you're going to do is you're going to subtract the mass after heating. Oh, well, here, let's go with the, the empty mass before from the mass after heating. It's going to be a relatively small number, you know, something on the order of like zero point something. Okay. Um, it's just how it is. Now, um, the pressure of the room comes from the instructor. There's only one barometer in the room and there's, it's on the instructor's desk. It's kind of hard to see unless you tilt it just right. So either your instructor will give you the pressure or you can go look at the barometer on that desk. Just don't remove it. Probably the hardest thing about this lab is maintaining the temperature. Now, because these scales, um, excuse me, I'm sorry, because the hot plates are not exactly, you can't set it to 275 or, you know, or something like that. You have to control it. So when you first start heating this, you're just going to crank it up. And when it finally gets to like approaching about 80, you can decide then if you need to slow it down or leave it where it's at. You want to maintain that temperature within about five degrees. And really the more steady you are, the closer you are to that temperature, uh, the better. And really you, you're given a range in the lab. So it doesn't matter if you're like 87 or 89, as long as you are maintaining the temperature as close to that temperature as possible for the whole heating time. So really somebody's going to have to be in charge of that knob on the hot plate. He, turn it up if you need to, turn it down when you when it gets to be a little above that and just kind of play with it the whole time until you've got it figured out. So this is going to come from the water bath. Now you guys know to get to uh, Kelvin, you're going to take the temperature in Celsius and make sure you have the right number of sig figs, guys. Every semester, students forget to read the thermometer correctly. And you're going to just add 273.15. And same thing, make sure when you add these up, you're going to go to the fewest decimal spaces, which is probably going to be one because of the thermometers most of you all have. Now, the volume of the vapor is a little bit more tricky to get. Now, you guys remember back in lab one, you took an empty beaker and you measured the height and the width and you did a calculation to find that the volume of that beaker was different from what was printed. So technically we could do a calculation here too, but this is a conical shape and then a flat shape. And then you have this little area down here. It's just too complicated. So what you guys are going to do to really make sure you know the volume of this flask is you're going to fill it 
all the way with water, all the way to the top, because that's how much the vapor would occupy. And this is only once everything else is done. And you're going to pour that water into a graduated cylinder. Now, you get a 100 mil graduated cylinder. This is a 125, or you guys are given a 125 mil uh, flask. So you're going to have to do it more than once. So you're going to end up having something like 100.0 plus, I don't know, um, 35.0 or something like that. Make sure you are reading it to the exact number of sig figs. So if you end up going 99.0 plus something, just write it down as it is. But remember, this is in milliliters. So you're going to be given the temperature, I mean the volume in milliliters from that graduated cylinder. But according to the gradu according to the ideal gas law, we want it in liters. And you're going to use that conversion factor of a thousand mils in one liter. Now, once you have the pressure of the room from the instructor, the temperature of the gas, uh, I'm sorry, temperature of the water, which we're assuming is the same as the gas um, in Kelvin, the volume in liters, we can plug it into that ideal gas law to find moles. Now, we know back here, PV equals nRT. So to solve for N, you would divide both sides by RT, and you're going to be left with PV divided by RT equals N. Where do I have that written? Right here. And so that's how you're going to get this um, uh, measurement here. Emma. So you're going to have N is equal to PV over RT. Now, guys, this is going to be a really small number. It's going to be something like 0, 0.00 something. Okay? Just make sure you're following your sig figs. You'll be okay. Now, in order to get molar mass, you have the grams of the, the vapor by looking at the mass of that volatile liquid up here. And you have the moles here. So to find molar mass, you're just going to take grams divided by moles, and that's going to give you your molar mass measurement here. Now you're doing this for two trials. The best way to do this is to go through trial one, get your new measurement from the empty flask, add in some, uh, you know, or uh, add, you have the, the mass of the empty flask, you'll add in some more volatile liquid, reheat, and go through it. Get the volume of that flask last. Once you get this, you can do these two calculations relatively quickly. Now, the next thing you want to do is really evaluate your sources of error. Okay, there are so many things that you guys could have a mistake with or that this lab could be run differently. So let's just look at um, grams. So every time I consider what the error is, I try to think of what which of these variables is it going to affect? How is that going to affect my measurement for each of these things? Okay, so let's just look at grams. Maybe when I went to measure my grams, there were water droplets on the foil that weren't there for the empty flask. So this is something that is going to be contributing to a mass that is not really from the vapor itself. It's not in any coming from anything else, but it's it's contributing to the mass. So it's going to make my grams look too high. Now, if my grams are too high, because grams is in the top of this equation, it's going to make my molar mass be calculated as too high. Okay, now on the other hand, maybe, maybe my th thermometer wasn't calibrated. Now you guys don't do this, but there's a couple other things you could come up with here. I'm just trying to give you an example and let you see how I would think about it. And my thermometer was reading about three Oh, I don't have the little button, so we'll say degrees too high. Now, if the temperature is too high, 
This is on the bottom of this equation. This is too high. It's going to make this measurement appear too low. I'm sorry, I have the wrong column. There we go. So what that's going to do is if my moles are too low, moles is in the bottom of the molar mass, it's going to make my molar mass look too high. Okay, And that's generally how I'm going to explain every single error that I could come up with. <laughs> so consider, you know, what error did you have when you were measuring volume, or was there one? And if so, was it going to make the volume too high or too low? Was it going to affect your mole, moles calculated as making it appear too high or too low? And how is that going to affect your molar mass? <coughs> this is really going to set you guys up for starting to see critically what's happening in your measurements and so on. Okay? <laughs>